Hi, everyone. Um, we're about to start week two. Um, so, you know, first, sigh of relief. Week one is always like so uh, crazy unpredictable because people are, you know, just getting into the class and they say, oh no, they can't get into the class. And we have to go through all the administravia. So that takes at least like 50% of the first bit of slides. And it's like a whole bunch of stuff, right? So, you know, whew, like we're finally done. Uh, there won't be any of the um, confetti poppers today. So, you know, you don't have to worry about that. Won't give anyone any heart attacks today. So just, whew. Um, there are a couple of things I, I want to talk about before we get into the uh, HTML uh, and CSS of the programming section. Uh, just as a reminder, my name is Andy. I'm your programming instructor, and this, this is half of the web design decal. Um, let me see here. I wanted to make a quick announcement about questions. So I'm hoping that uh, we saw a lot of questions written to our ask at wdd.io email. But for future reference, I think it'd be great, actually, if you just moved all your questions to Piazza. So that way we can all just you know, know all the questions are here, uh, and it's all standardized. So just for future reference, use Piazza as opposed to emailing us for, for questions. Um, let me see here. Uh, another thing. So uh, for WDD Live people, uh, that is people who are joining us live right now on our live webcasts, uh, one thing that you can do that I don't think I mentioned last time is that you can create an account on, on WDD Portal. So that way you can access our homeworks uh, and all of our resources. And uh, we can't guarantee that we'll, we'll grade your, er, any homework that you turn in because we have to focus on, on the people who are enrolled. But just so you know, uh, it is an option to create an account on WDD Portal. Um, so yeah, I hope, I hope that's awesome news for anyone who's watching us live. Uh, but anyway, back to, back to this room. Uh, oh, so there's also office hours, too, for this course. Uh, I think, I'm not sure if we mentioned that uh, as, as explicitly as we wanted to, but basically, if you come join us from 3 to 5 p.m. on Sundays at uh, the Free Speech Movement Cafe, which is right next to Moffitt, uh, we'll be there. So uh, please come join us if you have any questions. I know you probably don't for this, for this first time around because the, uh, the homework was, was I'd say relatively OK. But in the future, when we're starting to make some really complex front ends, uh, you might want to come by and ask us a question. So uh, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, some questions. Does, does anyone have any questions about anything right now related to the homework or the web or life in general? Does anyone have any questions? For, did anyone spend more than, more than an hour on the homework? Was it was for anyone like, kind of challenging? Or did everyone, did everyone sort of spend like between zero and one hour? Because, OK. I mean, that's, that's, good, that's good to know. That's good. I mean, like, it's fine if you took a little bit longer, because uh, like, you know, this, this class like, really varies a lot. For who was it, or for whom, was it their first actual program, uh, this homework one? Like, the first time they ever wrote stuff that wasn't? Raise, raise your hands high, because I really want to see. OK. That's awesome. Yeah. Really cool. That's really awesome. I mean, like you know, it's the first time you're writing something that's not an essay, I guess, uh, that only computers can understand. That's totally non-ambiguous syntax. That's not really English. Any, yeah, just you know, congrats. That's really awesome. Um, so yeah, that's that's really cool. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's talk about what we'll be talking about today. First thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about. Uh, we're going to review last week, so basically all the HTML tags uh, that I talked about last week, we'll just quickly go over those. Uh, and then we have a, um, a goal. So basically, I want us, basically every time we start programming section, I just want to say, by the end of tonight, we will do X. And then so you can kind of get excited, like, oh, sweet, I know how to do X by the end of the design, or rather, programming section. Um, we're going to go over some, some last HTML tags that are also relatively common. Uh, but uh, and, and so, so are definitely worth talking about. Uh, we're going to go over something called IDs and classes. So basically, if you think about um, how you turn this web page that you made for homework, which is sort of a very static sort of HTML 1.0, uh, you know, just really, really basic site, and how, do you, how would you style that? Well, then there, th there has to be some way that you can sort of target certain elements. Uh, and so IDs and classes are, are the answer to that question. We'll talk about those. Uh, and finally, we'll begin. Uh, CSS, which is really the styling language for the whole web. And so that'll be really exciting, too. Uh, and finally, programming section will close out 
with uh, Philip and Tomas, who will do this awesome hands-on with you guys, and uh, we'll create a pretty awesome site. So that's programming section for week two. So last week, you know, here's just the sort of laundry list of, of all the tags that we went over. Uh, you know, like H1 for large headings, bold, uh, italicized text, things of this nature. Um, you know, basically a recap is that most of the web is written in hypertext markup language, also known as HTML. Um, and so as a result, uh, HTML is made up of, of tags, and each tags have different functions based on what, which tags you choose. And so here's just a list of them. That's just week one and recap. Uh, I just wanted to make a clarification too. So last week I told you that this was the structure that, that uh, essentially every HTML page you've ever seen looks like. And indeed that's true, but I, also, I guess I just also wanted to add a sort of clarification or a sort of, um, a sort of change that I wanted to say. I wish I had put up this slide instead. And so as you can see, you know, the difference between that slide and this slide is that there's this doc type HTML. And what that essentially does, uh, it doesn't change your page uh, visually in any way. So you won't, you won't actually see that text come up. Essentially all it does, it's, it's for, um, it's actually to be compliant with the XHTML standards. So uh, basically, in terms of accessibility on older browsers, having this at the top is a good thing to have. So just for future reference, start all your pages like this. Tonight, by the end of tonight, I want everyone here to know how to style web pages. So you know, we're going from this sort of really basic uh, HTML 1.0, like I said, to Finally, you know, starting to add some, some things or, or seeing how we can begin to add some styling uh, into our web pages for the very first time. Uh, but before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about these uh, HTML tags too, so we'll just quickly go through these. Uh, the first of this is um, the ordered list. Uh, and so it's, it's kind of self-explanatory. And if you want, actually, we should probably go into a browser and uh, see what they do. So I'm bringing up JS Fiddle. Uh, in case you weren't here last time, JS Fiddle is essentially, essentially allows me to run some really basic HTML stuff uh, within the browser. But anyway, uh, so this, this is the uh, ordered list. It starts off with, let me zoom in for anyone. So it starts off with the tag OL, which stands for ordered list. I'm going to close the tag. And then uh, every list has list items, of course, right? So I'm just if I wanted to make one of these, I simply add some list items. Uh, and so on and so forth. And then if we render this, it comes out like so. So basically, uh, an ordered list is sort of self-explanatory. It basically puts ordering elements uh, for your list. So you have you know, one, two, and three. <coughs> so if you were to render that, you know, this is what it would look like, essentially. So yeah, that, that's an ordered list. Uh, very closely related to that is the HTML unordered list. And so you know, it's, it's really similar syntax. But instead of OL, you have UL, which stands for unordered list. Uh, when you render it, it looks like this, and it has bullet points. And so you, know, you might think, like, uh, why are you showing this to me? Uh, I, I don't typically see you know, bullet points on websites anymore. And to that end, you're actually really correct. It's, it's not, uh, you, you never see it like this just by itself. But what you have to understand is that like, lists are a pretty powerful thing to have in general uh, when displaying information on any given website. So uh, let me give you an example. So I'm going to uh, googleventures.com. Uh, and um, notice how you know, on, the, on the side of this website, there is this sort of vertical nav bar where you can just you know, go to various things like who they've invested in and uh, things like that. Um, let me see. OK. So you, know, you say, like, oh, that's awesome. Like, I, like, what does this have to do with unordered lists? Well, you know, we can use the web inspector, which is uh, the thing that we learned about last time, the almighty awesome web dev tool that will tell you everything about anything you've ever been curious about on the web. Right? And if you'll notice, uh, and I'll zoom in a little bit, but if you notice, um, this here is the unordered list tag that I was just talking about. Right? And then in here are various list items. And it so happens, and think, uh, you'll notice how Web Inspector is showing us which one maps to which. But every list item is one of these, is one of these uh, nav bar items, too. Right? 
Obviously, there's a little bit of extra stuff too. Like you'll notice there's this little image next to each one of them that you know you have to like source the image, and we saw the tags they did that last time. But essentially, I mean, you know, Web Inspector just reveals all, right? Like here's here's the list item. Uh, it links to uh, this website.com/library. Uh, um, some other stuff that we haven't talked about yet, but but basically, you know, notice how the the sort of uh, structure of everything is unordered list, even though it doesn't look like uh, the one that I showed you, which is um, which is the one with you know standard circular bullet points. Uh, and you, you might ask like, well, why? How come you know that one looks so pretty and so sophisticated and developed, and yours looks like uh, HTML 1.0? Uh, the answer to that is CSS. So we'll go over that soon. Ah, okay. So finally, um, the HTML table. So uh, this one you can try out if you want to. It's, it's essentially um, two table tags at the very ends, uh, and then TR, which stands for table row. So um, let's see. Rows, rows go this way. Columns go this way. So uh, you know, I'll have a row that's like name and age. And then on, this, on the second row, or the row below that, I'll have Andy and uh, 20. And so you render it like this, and it should come out something like this. Uh, again, you know, when you actually when you actually do it, it's not the most impressive thing by itself. But you can imagine that if you had like uh, like a really complicated web app and you need to display like a lot of information, uh, you could use a table, right? Even like a standard plain uh, you know HTML1 table would would certainly work. It just wouldn't necessarily be the the uh, the best looking thing. <coughs> so um, actually, I'm going to do it real quick. Just just show y'all. Okay, so table, and then, um, so yeah, I want a row here. Uh, and I think I'll just take, I'll take three rows. So what I've done is I've, I'm just copy pasting because you know, the syntax is the same. Um, and then, so there's also TH, which stands for table heading. Uh, and so this, what this does is essentially bolts whatever you put in here. So I'm going to put, California, and then I'll also put Arizona, so I guess I'll just, uh, I'll just show the scores, or what I hope the scores will be uh, come this, this weekend when we play Arizona. By the way, as of this moment in time, we are 2-0 uh, and o in football, so you know, now that we're like YouTube, you know, in this moment in time, we're undefeated. <laughs> so if anything happens, watch this video and remember a time when we were undefeated. <laughs> okay. So if this renders like I hope it should, I get this sort of table. Ah, notice everything is bold, and the reason for that is that I made everything a heading. So the proper way to do columns that are just standard is just using TD instead. So I'm just going to do that. There. Okay. So now you know it's left justified as as opposed to center justified. Uh, it's no longer bold, and there you have a really simple table. And if you wanted to add you know another row. Uh, I think it's fairly straightforward. You just add another TR column, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, let's see here. Just out of curiosity, I'm just going to add another column to this last one, um, just to see what happens if there were like a tie. I wonder what happens to this table. Okay, so you just get like floating off things, but it all essentially builds, you know, into a table. So, in case you were curious, like I was, uh, that's what happens. Yeah, so if you have any data, consider using a table. Uh, you know, these are the basic commands for it. Uh, and you know, they d it doesn't look the best when you don't add any styling to it, but you know, we'll, we'll get to that really soon. Ah, yes, OK. All right, here's where things get a little bit more interesting. So uh, I talked about last time, I sort of foreshadowed that there's this one tag that will sort of be used like way more than the others in practice. And, and that tag is the, the div. 
Uh, div is short for division, and so you know that's a really general term, right? Like to like just a division of a page could be like almost almost anything can be a, a div. Practically everything you look at, especially on on Sean's web pages, like 99% of the things you see are are divs or wrapped in divs. Um, so it has no special properties by itself, ex and um, another, uh, but a sort of sort of uh, feature of it, I guess, or trait of it is that they stack vertically. Uh, and there are ways to make it stack horizontally, but but they t they already by by themselves stack vertically. Um, so if you have like multiple texts within divs, uh, they'll they'll sort of stack this way. Uh, and as a result, because they stack this way, we call those block elements. So that's that's why I have block element written here. Um, it's used for laying out stuff, really. Like uh, every everything that you might have to lay out. So everything from sort of buttons to uh, to forms. That, that people have to enter in, most likely will probably be wrapped uh, in a div. Or, or there are probably exceptions to all those things, but, but essentially, if you want to like quickly apply some rules to anything, you sort of wrap it in a div. Um, the span. So the span is, is uh, kind of like the div in that it's used for layout. It also doesn't have any visual properties on its own. Uh, but unlike being block, it, it's inline. So you know things stack horizontally, uh, and it's it's just sort of inline with the text. Uh, and so, you know, I guess I guess we could definitely uh, do a qu quick demo. Although I don't. Let's see. Well, not the most uh, <laughs> not the most uh, engaging demo. But doesn't this make sense, right? Because I said, like, you know, uh, block block would st uh, stack vertically, right? So it sort of pushes the next thing to to the to the bottom. But it so happens that the next thing just stacks horizontally. So really, it just looks like uh, you pressed enter. Like, you know, just just for future reference, uh, this this will start to look way more exciting. You know, you got to start somewhere. <coughs> and that's uh, at least as far as I can tell. That's that's all I wanted to say about HTML. Uh, Sean, did I have a comment from you? Yeah, what happens if you add another span at the end of that? OK. I mean, wh well, what do, you, what do you think? Like, wh what does everyone think will happen if you add another span to it? To, to this, rather. <coughs> Answer. Does it add it to the right when pushing the inline? Uh, why do you say that? That that actually is you know that's all you really need to say actually, uh, yep because because inline. <laughs> so there you go you know it, it gets stacked right on the end, uh, block versus inline essentially the two main races of of web elements. <coughs> okay, uh, does anyone have any questions about HTML? Question. Uh, so the question was, do you need n tags for uh, ordered lists and unordered lists? The answer is yes, right? So you sort of have to like say when the list ends, right? So you have list items, bam, like slash ol, slash ul. Good question. Um, question over here. Uh, I have no idea. Uh, there, does anyone? Table data. Okay, there you go. Table data. It makes sense. Uh, I saw a hand. Was there another question out here? Question over here? Yeah. Uh, can you nest lists? Okay. So the question was, can you nest lists? I'm pretty sure the answer is yes. But however, you know, like like with anything, I'd like to give it a shot. So, real quick, I'm going to make a unordered list. Okay, so in here, oops. The answer is yes. 
So notice it's kind of like if, if you had like um, if you're working in, in some sort of text editor, right, and you had like bullet points, then it was just sort of like nested bullet points, just like you would in a standard uh, blitz like that. So you know, that's how it works. Uh, any other last questions about HTML? Another question. Yes. Yes. Oh, yes. So I guess, yeah, this might be like a sort of exclusive term to, to computer science, possibly. But yeah, nest, nesting means to sort of like uh, put it inside another, in a way. Um, so bottom line about HTML, I think uh, it's, it's fairly straightforward, right? Like there's, there's, it's just a language, a markup language uh, that has no ambiguity, right? Like there's no two ways to interpret any one instruction that you give it. It's like a good language. It, it's just sort of uh, very straightforward. Uh, and HTML is not really about memorizing as many tags as you can. Uh, it's more about knowing when to use what, is what I'd say. So, uh, you know, it's, it's about recognizing, like, hey, if I have a nav bar uh, and, I want, and I want it to say, like, you know, contact us about team, you know, and all the standard things you have on a nav bar, uh, as opposed to just making them separate elements that are sort of unrelated, you have the intuition and you think, you know, I think uh, an unordered list would actually probably be best for that. And so that's, that's really what, you know, writing good HTML is about. And not so much, I know the table tag, and I know the section tag, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because uh, there, are, there are more than I've shown you. I've only shown you sort of a small subset. But I think this is what, what really you, you should know, um, is, is that really it's just about when, knowing when to use what. Um, and yeah, and in case, you know, there, there's any that I've missed, I'm sure there, there's a lot, uh, you can always Google them. So Google is a good, a good web dev tool as well. Let's talk about cascading style sheets. So uh, like HTML, it's not like a, like a strict actual programming language. Uh, it's it's uh, a style sheet language, right? So basically, its sole purpose is to, is to uh, give, give sort of instructions for elements on the page. And just as a review, when I say elements, I mean uh, HTML tags that include whatever content is between them, right? So you, you often want to stag, uh, you often want to style uh, elements on a page, and this is how you basically do them. This is what um, production CSS, I guess, would, would look like when it's when like it's done. It's really really long. Um, so notice on on the uh, on the left side, uh, it's, it's zoomed in, but if you look on the right, it's actually sort of like a zoomed out version of the whole file. And when you have like a big site, of course, you know, there's a ton of elements on a big site, so that you get like a lot, a lot of long stuff, right? It's just really long. Um, and yeah, this is what it looks like, right? Notice how the green elements on here, or the green text on here is, is uh, well, they're all, they all have hashtags. What does that mean? Well, we'll go over those soon. And then, you know, nested under those is, uh, is like some, some word and a colon and, and some value. Uh, and so we'll see what, that, what that's all about, too. But essentially, you know, this is what CSS looks like. This is what really drives like, what all pretty websites look like. like so no matter how like, pretty or artistic you might think that that website is, uh, it actually you know, is, is, looks like this under the hood. So there you know. Now you know. Uh, CSS, when, when in best practices, it gets its own CSS file. And like we said earlier, there, we have to link that CSS file uh, to our HTML page. Uh, other best practices include that we apply uh, as much of the same CSS as we can to multiple pages. Uh, and this is a good thing because you don't have any redundancy. So like, it, it's really kind of annoying if you have like, a giant CSS file, which is typically not like, a good thing, uh, unless, of course, you've used that optimally. And by optimally, I mean uh, you, you've used elements that in, in a smart way that, that doesn't mean you have to like, uh, well, like, in the worst case, for every element, you, you write like, a ton of CSS. And you don't reuse anything, so you know that's bad. That's hard to read. Uh, not good. Not good dev. Um, and yeah, you have to link your your HTML page, uh, your CSS file to your HTML page. And to do that, this is the text for it. Uh, no need to memorize it because, of course, the slides are available on WDD Portal. But uh, in case you're curious, there's a link tag, and it has an attribute. Uh, so the attribute is rel which is relation. So what is the relationship to the page? Well, it's the style sheet of the page. The uh, type attribute shows you know, what, what kind of type is it. Well, it's text slash uh, CSS code. <coughs> and the reference, href, 
uh, attribute points to the file path. So this is, this is not totally, uh, this is kind of misleading because the file path is sort of non-existent. It's like in the same folder, in this case, as the style.css. But uh, in most cases, it'll probably be uh, you know, assets slash CSS slash style.css. So uh, yeah, href would typically be a file path. Uh, question. <laughs> uh, the answer is no. Actually, um, if you if you actually so the question was, can the quote can the th the things in quotes uh, be anything? Uh, well, well, I think it's clear that for some of these that that's clearly not the case. Like href, for example, like you know, the, the, obviously the file path has to be the right file path. But um, you know, the relation actually like if you actually uh, don't have relation equals style sheet, it will not render with CSS. So, so, so are they are, they are. Again, you know, like. Non-ambiguity. That's programming languages in general. Like, there's no two one ways. There's no like kinda like oh, it doesn't mean that. It's it's literally like that's what it means. And if it's wrong, then it is totally your fault. <laughs> like, the, it's not because like the the rendering engine of the browser you know messed up because computers won't mess up in that way. They'll mess up in a million different other ways, but they won't mess up in that way. Uh, but yeah, I hope you looked at this long enough. Uh, in case you forget it, you know it's always on these slides. Okay, let's see here. So I think there's a bit of a, there we go. Okay. Uh, so this is what one, one sort of uh, CSS element looks like. I'm just going to give some names to it. Um, so this is, geez, this is going to bother me. Okay. <clears throat> so this is what one CSS selector looks like. Uh, what does it entail? Well, there's first, the first thing is the selector, right? So you can sort of imagine CSS like, like uh, things that just sort of target particular elements on the page. In this case, what are, what are we selecting? Body. body. So what that means is that everything, like, like everything in the body of the HTML, so you remember how HTML looks like there's HTML head, everything in the body, okay, pretty much everything on the page will be affected by all this. So at least if we had no other rules, no other CSS rules, uh, it would look at all the font, would be 25 pixels tall. The color of all the font would be white. Um, the background color would be this, this color here. I think, is that a gray? I, I don't remember. We'll have to find that out. But this, this, uh, this hexadecimal, uh, hexadecimal color would be uh, the color of the whole background of the page. Right? So instead of the standard white that you get, it would be this color. Uh, and all the text would be all center aligned. So nothing would be left justified. It would always be floating in the center for everything. Uh, that is if you had no other rules but this one. So that's what a selector does, right? It just, it just picks out certain HTML element, in this case, the entire body, uh, and it applies these properties. <coughs> so you know, as you might imagine, uh, if we look at one property uh, in particular, in the property of color, uh, the property of color, the property name is color and the value is white. So what that means is the text color is white, not to be confused with uh, background color. So uh, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of uh, I don't know, not poorly named, I guess, in that color will affect the, the color of your text. But if you really wanted to, to uh, have the background be a different color, then you use background color or background in general. That, that would work, too. Yeah, quick question. Oh, question. Yeah, um, there you had an actual color name for color? Or what ah. There, what color did you actually put in there? Sure thing. So the question was, uh, you know, Andy, how come you have like white as your color there, but the other one you have a hexadecimal color? Uh, so, first of all, Sean will have like a whole lecture on color uh, and hexadecimal, and like you know, why is it, why does it look like that? So, stay tuned for that. Uh, but secondly, there are certain like really basic colors that that uh, CSS will recognize. So, if you just said like you know, red, white, green, like orange, purple, you know, it, it, they'll know those things. But you know, <coughs> actually, I think it goes pretty advanced nowadays. Like you can say pretty particular colors. But you know, just just for the sake of um, of staying consistent, uh, that that is an option. But mostly, we're going to use hexadecimal colors. Question. So why did you italicize the colors? Uh, I italicize those. I, so I, I italicize every property because Sublime does that. And what I want to do on the slides was sort of mimic exactly what Sublime does. So these are actually s roughly the colors that uh, Sublime r renders it into. 
So you know, you'll see this too. I suspect most people are using Sublime for their code editors, unless you know they already like really know what they're doing and they chose they have like another favorite. But is it for the, who's using Sublime? Sublime Text too. Okay. All right. Good to know. All right. So for now on, like I'll probably say Sublime and Code Editor uh, in interchangeably, because most people are using it. Uh, are there any other questions? <coughs> awesome. <coughs> so yeah, you know this is what CSS Select looks like. Let's do something fun. Let's uh, let's for the first time ever style some HTML. <coughs> so for this, I think. You know, I think I'll actually. Um, I think I'll actually do this in Sublime, because I think that'd be way more interesting. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to. Uh, so if everyone has Sublime open and wants to follow along, this is what we'll be doing. First thing I want to do is actually tell Sublime that I'm going to be using uh, HTML. So I go to View Syntax HTML. And I'll just set up the stuff real quick. OK, uh, so if I save this, what's a good place to save this? Is this all right, Sean, <coughs> your desktop? OK, all right. So yeah, save it in a place where you know it'll be, and you can open it up. And as you might expect, you know, it's, it's uh, totally empty. OK, first thing I want to do is Hmm. I'm going to create uh, a CSS file. So the way you do that is you open up another tab. In this case, for Sublime, you can actually just double click up at the top here, right? And then uh, you go to View, and same as last time, you go to Syntax. And this time, among all these languages, I'm going to choose CSS. Uh, and I'll save this. Uh, in this case, I'll just save it right in the same file just to, to keep things simple. So I'll call it style.css, which is normally what we call these things. Um, and in here, I'm going to link it. So link rel style sheet type. Um, and let's see here, href. OK. So now, like, like I said, the whole purpose is just to make this, this little rectangle, right? Uh, and like, how would you make a rectangle? Well. Here. So remember I always said how divs, uh, when you first create them, are literally uh, not much. Like if I save this and I render this, I would get not, not much. I'm going to zoom in on this. <coughs> um, but the thing is, like, what, what actually happens around here is that you actually create this sort of invisible little box around this, right? And what you can do is actually you can style what this box looks like. So uh, I'm going to go in here. I'm going to say that every div on the page should have a height of um, 100 pixels and a width of 200 pixels. And every div should also have a background of, of uh, this color. Now if I save everything, and I go here and I refresh my page, for the first time ever, we see that we're actually using uh, CSS, so whatever is in style.css, and we're modifying what's in this HTML, right? So the HTML has this div tag that says not much, uh, and here we have surrounded it in this pink box. And there's all sorts of things you can do with this box, actually, too. Like, um, so if I'm in not much right now, and I decide to say, border radius 15 pixels. I can add this sort of like curve, curveness to this, right? 
and depending on how many CSS properties you know. And we'll go over these enough so that you'll, you'll really start to get to know them. Uh, I also don't like how the color uh, clashes with this pink. And so yeah, I'm just going to make it white. I'm going to center it, too, because it looks odd. And there you have the beginnings of a button, uh, the humble beginnings of a button. It's, it's not obviously not great because you know, I'm the programming instructor, not the design uh, instructor. <laughs> but like, you know, like, you, do you guys see now all of a sudden like, what, what was just not much in the corner has suddenly become uh, something a little different, something that you can actually style if you know the right rules. Right? So uh, you know, finally, we're moving and we're getting somewhere. Uh, now I want to talk about classes and IDs, that thing that I was telling you about earlier, about being particular. Uh, so what counts as a selector? First and foremost, any HTML tag, but you know, it would apply for the entire tag, right? So for all divs that I put on that page, they'd all have all those properties. Not necessarily something you want. So to be a bit more specific, we have classes and IDs. Uh, and so we distinguish all of our, all of our divs. Uh, in, in this case, it's not just divs, but it could be any tags, really, into, into IDs and classes. Um, and so, let's see here. Well, one of the last things I'll go over for, for today, because I realize that I think uh, time is a bit of a constraint right now, but one of the last things I'll go over is this idea of IDs and classes. Uh, so what it looks like, really, is, is something like this. In the HTML, you have something like div uh, ID equals uh, quote something if you're using an ID. Or uh, if you're using a class, it's just the same thing, except you use class as the attribute. Uh, and so what are they all about? Well, basically, you can think of them as uh, ways you can be particular on, on when styling a page, right? So you use a class uh, for something to use more than, more than once. So what do I mean by that? Uh, well, I mean that if, if, you're, if you have something that you use like all the time, like, like circular images, for example, like on WDD.io, uh, instead of using IDs to make every one of those images circular, you just say this class. Maybe you'll call it circular, right? And then uh, you apply the, the rules in there. And then for everything that needs to be circular, you just apply the same class. Now, sometimes you have exceptions to those classes, right? Sometimes you want one thing to be slightly different than the others. That's when IDs come in. So uh, I hope that makes sense. But basically, let's see. Yeah. Uh, there, are, there are IDs and classes. So real quick. Uh, how would you style just the first paragraph, like the text in first paragraph? Notice how like one of them has an ID that's just first, whereas the other one doesn't. It has an ID called second, right? Uh, so basically, what, one thing you can do is you can just uh, in the CSS you can call um, you can call just the first element, and you use that you use the hashtag, and you do first. Uh, and so, you know, if you, same thing if you're use, just doing the second one, right? You use hashtag and then uh, second, and then all the rules that apply to that. Uh, if you want to do both, you could use just the entire class paragraph and just say, like, for every paragraph, I wanted to have these rules. Uh, question. In your last slide, was it just a convention that you use classes uh, horizontally and not vertically? Uh, okay. So the oh, okay, the question is why I use it horizontally, not vertically. In the, in the, in the, the slide before this. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this is an error on the slides. I think this is a copy paste error on the slides. Uh, yeah, let me let me let me. Uh, I'll repost the slides because I think this is a this is an error. So my bad on that one. Uh, okay. Uh, can I answer any last questions? Because I think this is all I have time for. Question. Oh, great question. So the question was, do you use hashtags in CSS for both classes and IDs? The answer is no. Uh, so you use, you, use, um, you use hashtags only for IDs, and you use periods for classes. <coughs> so uh, I think that's what actually was supposed to be said here. I don't know why the slides reverted, uh, but I'll post the proper slides later. So basic rule, hashtag for IDs, uh, period for classes. Question? Uh, so technically, you could. So the question was, can you give uh, two IDs for two different divs on the same page? You technically could, uh, but it wouldn't be good practice. So everything would render correctly, but in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, reading, reading the page, the page's code, it, it wouldn't be the right usage. 
So that's, that's the answer to the question. question. Let me see here. So real quick, uh, so I'm just going to end real soon. But basically, you know, they allow things us to be a bit more particular than just saying the whole body should have these rules. Uh, you know, IDs and classes will help you out with those. Uh, and I'll probably talk a little bit more about this next week in case this is still confusing. Uh, but you know, there's also the fundamental question, what happens when an ID and a class uh, clash in terms of their properties? Like what if one, one of them says the text color should be, should be white and the other one says orange? You know, who wins out? Uh, and so this is sort of like a quiz, right? Um, do we uh, accidentally create a crease in, in space time? Um, do we divide by, by zero? Because that would probably cause the first one actually, or I don't know. <laughs> like, but that would be bad too. Uh, does the ID always win over classes? Um, or does, does uh, Sean's hair suddenly turn blonde? Um, so I think you know, the, I'll do this more often because I, I want to keep you guys engaged. Uh, but I think the answers should be, should be pretty obvious uh, like based on the answers. Um, <laughs> Sean. <laughs> the ID comes out victorious. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense actually, right? Because it's kind of like what I said earlier. Classes are for like things that you use multiple times, but sometimes you want to make exceptions, and that's why IDs exist. OK. Uh, so we'll talk more about CSS properties. Let's do a hands-on. So right now, I want to welcome uh, Tomas and Philip to the stage to uh, make a website with you guys. All right, good evening, guys. Um, <clears throat> today, uh, for our hands-on activity, we'll be creating a web page from scratch um, with the HTML and doing a little bit of CSS. Um, so Tomas and I guess the rest of the web design team desi decided that this website should be about a hobby or an instrument I used to play in high school. So yeah, I used to play the saxophone. And I don't know why they wanted to do this. But <laughs> yeah, this is going to be what we're going to do today. So we're literally, literally going to start from scratch, um, create the HTML, and then style the CSS. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions from the lecture right now that we can answer? Because we went. Pretty fast, yeah? Yeah, when you put the color back in the first div, if you have a div after that and you get a similar color back in, is it overlap? Uh, so, okay, so the question was uh, if you have like two divs and they're both, they're both IDs, or the, well, actually it shouldn't really matter, yeah. but like, you know, one thing says the background should be one thing, uh, and the next says something else. It's really sort of the last thing that is chosen, because, you know, if you imagine like how HTML. Uh, or the, how the browser engine would, would render it, it looked for like whatever you said the last thing was, assuming they're of the same sort of ranking. So what determines like the size of the div on the website? Size of, uh, OK, so you said, OK, I think I misunderstood your question, because I, I thought you meant the entire background of the page. Uh, but if, if two separate divs, like two rectangles, in a, if, for example, have two different color backgrounds, then they'll just be the colors that you assign them. Is that, does that answer your question, or am I misunderstanding you still? Yes. Um, is that background I set then the size of the entire div? So my next div starts at the below, at, or below that? I'm just confused about how divs are spaced. Sure thing. Uh, so, so the answer to that is it, the, whatever you put as the background will fill up the entire space of the div, depending on how big you made it. Um, and as, it, as opposed to the, the relation of the position to those, there's a whole lecture on that. There's like uh, relative positions and absolute positions that we will talk about. So like. Basically, the answer is however you want it. Uh, but you have to know how to make it how you want it. And we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, this will all come soon. OK, are we good? Awesome. OK, so um, 
On the right, you see the basic structure of the HTML that Andy mentioned. Um, you want that doc type, and then HTML. Everything on your web page is within HTML. And then we have the head and the body. And okay, okay, I'm ready. Okay. okay, where's that laid out? Yeah, I'm, I'm open it. Okay. So. okay, so we have the doc type for accessibility, right? Um, older browsers like IE, um, this helps them kind of helps the browser understand. Okay, this is going to be an HTML document, and then um, everything is within the HTML tags. So we're going to have <coughs> an HTML opening tag with the HTML closing tag, and then head, and then body. All right, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, of course. Okay. So this is generally how you guys would go about when you guys um, start from scratch creating a website. Um, and indenting, as always, like it's not a rule, but it definitely helps readability. Okay, so now we have this basic uh, structure set up. So um, we're going to have CSS um, in this hands-on, so we want to link it. So if with the link tag, we can tell this uh, HTML page that, oh, my CSS is here. I want everything in the CSS file to style my HTML elements. So as always, we, um, we have rel, type, and href. Um, remember, type, rel tells you, like, oh, this is a style sheet. Type tells you, um, like, if you do text slash CSS, it says that um, the file is a CSS file, and href is where the location of the CSS file is. And if you look to the left, um, in that gray bar right there, you can see um, the file structure. And you see from index.html, oh. style.css should be in the same folder. So Tomas made a mistake, right? Uh, he should not have done assets slash CSS slash style.css. Yeah, he said it was in his laptop. So <laughs> we'll excuse him this time. Um, it's in the same directory. So you literally just say style.css. because the HTML document can see the style.css document. Um, One second. Can we yeah. put you here? <coughs> OK. Um, it's working. Sorry, guys. Oh, sorry, guys. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's in another one. Yeah, it's not my fault. I use Chrome script. Chrome fault. <laughs> so. <laughs> All right, here okay. we go. Okay. Awesome. Image two. Yeah. Um, okay. So we haven't had any CSS rules yet, but we will edit that later. Just know f right now where we are is that our CSS file and our HTML file are linked right now. So now we're going to edit our body, um, put content within the HTML page. And as I said before, Tomas really wanted to make this about me. So uh, <laughs> we're going to have like a he heading, header tag. And do you guys remember what happens? Like, what's the difference between an H1 tag and an H2 tag? Size, right. Size matters. Um, so H1, <laughs> H1, um, Tomas, what would you like the header of this? I would want it, it, it to be silky. Smooth. Okay. Okay. So, so it's a silky smooth page. What else would you like on this? Mm, how about a uh, very sexy? Uh, okay. So I guess my website or yeah, ver I'm very sexy. Um, so H2 like so size it's smaller. So you can kind of see it as a sub header. So it's like silky smooth and then smaller, very sexy. Um, Where's the image? Korean. Oh, Korean. <laughs> how, how do I leave Korean? Up here, up here. <laughs> Where's the image? Where's the image? His, his image. Uh, Sorry, guys. There's a little bit of technical difficulties. Um, we didn't practice on this computer, but we did practice. In my computer. <laughs> Find uh, Philip. Oh 
Welcome to Anna Shiris. <laughs> yes. Okay. Should uh, should we? Yeah, so I used to play saxophone in uh, high school and middle school. Um, I like playing jazz a lot. So, I mean, I wasn't jazz man. I wasn't very good, but yeah, that's me. Okay, so <laughs> sorry about <laughs> Facebook. Oh my God. I'll no, no, that's, no, that's no? forget about okay, them. Okay, forget okay, about okay. them. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, so there's no image this time. Um, so I guess we don't even need this image tag. Um, when we practice, there's an image of me um, playing the saxophone. But yeah, so we have the H1 and H2, um, and then we're gonna have some content within uh, the website. So, Tomas, what about me would you like to say? Mm, how about? Sexy men play the sax. <laughs> okay, uh, that's not true, but. Please, please. Thank you. Oh my god. <laughs> See, like, this is the problem with the web design decal team. Like, they're just really intent on doing stuff like this, embarrassing me in front of everyone. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So, not here. Here. Okay, yeah. So, uh, one thing to notice is. When you say uh, SRC, like the source of the image, you have to make sure that you also specify the file extension. And um, if you guys look to the left, the hierarchy of the files, um, sax.png is within images. And so from the point of view of index.html, we have to jump into the image folder to, in order to see the sax.png folder. So that's why we have images slash sax.png. Are there any questions so far? Yeah. Okay. There's no assets. Usually, um, the way you want to set up the file structure is to have an assets folder that the image folder is contained in. But um, laptop. his laptop is over there, not here. So, it, like, it's kind of weird right now. But the point is, you should you should be able to kind of tell like where it is by just looking at the file structure. So it's not always like one. It's not always one way. It depends on where the location of things are. Does that kind of make sense? It's not like copy and paste every time assets slash images. Like when you go into real real world and you do like real world web dev, it might not be the same structure. So you have to know like where exactly it is. Um, okay, so uh, so do you guys see this like little broken file? Can anyone tell me why it's not working? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, close the images. Thing. Yeah. So if you see now, like they're all kind of in the same level, right? Um, so index.html is already within this week two programming folder. Do you, do you see that? So it's relative path. So relative to where index.html is, this picture is within the images tag. Do you, do you kind of get it? Yeah. Do you know why? Okay. okay, yeah, so <laughs> the images should work, but Sean's laptop is just very strange. Okay, uh, we'll start, we're sorry, yeah? I think it's because the HTML file is on the desktop, and we have folders on the Oh, is that what you, okay. Okay, okay. Let's, uh, let's find it. Okay, sorry. Okay, okay, yeah. Okay, so um, pretend there's an image there, and now we're going to start styling the HTML and CSS. So as we said before, this um, inspector is a really great way to see your CSS changes live. So um, you can see that HTML on the left and CSS rules on the right. And now we want to add some styling to the HTML page. Um, Tomas, if you push the plus button. Oh, nice. 
So yeah, now it's like body. So you guys kind of see how this is like similar to CSS syntax. Um, you can type like background and choose a color. So that's black. But now um, all our text we can't see. So we change color to white. One thing to be careful of, there is no text color. It's just color. Um, and then text line center. So it's just like these very basic CSS tags you guys will end up learning. Um, there's a lot more you can do and to make it look a lot nicer. But what we have right now, um, with what we know right now, this is what we can do. So you see it's editing live, and the changes are happening right now. And oh. yeah, so border radius makes like the edge of the images round. And uh, a lot of people like that. You don't want like just hard edges. It doesn't look aesthetically pleasing. All right, so um, Tomas put some border in. You guys will definitely learn these later. And now we want to save the changes to our HTML. So um, what you can do is click on the inspector style sheet. And this shows you all the CSS attributes you've added this time, um, this round. So Control Command A, Command C, and then find your CSS file and paste it in. No, this oh, is this is for what this. Do you see? It's this. Okay. Desktop. Yeah. All right. So uh, one way to check that your changes went through is if you go to the web page and you refreshed it. Um, not like nothing changes because that's what you left it with. So like one thing you want to be careful as, careful of is if you forget to save all your CSS changes into the actual style.css file and you refresh the page or you reload the page, you'll lose everything you've done that round. So make sure you really save all the changes before you reload the page or like go back or just leave the page in general because you don't want all your work just like disappearing. Yeah. Are there any questions? I'm uh, sorry, like the images didn't work and the file path was weird, but sorry, guys. yeah, yeah. Um, my editor is complaining that the image tag does not have alt and alt attributes. Do you know what you're about? So, uh, you alt alt th um, these attributes, like there's an alt that you can have. It is for like if the image doesn't exist, replace the image with whatever's in here, either an image or a text. Um, Yeah, you don't have to have the alt attribute in it, but that's what alt would do. Yeah. Can you show us real quick how you use the CSS on Sublime? Okay. Um, yeah. Like you mean the way Andy was doing it uh, during the lecture? Yeah. Okay. So um, the thing is, like, we generally recommend doing it through um, the inspector. But if you want to do it this way, um, you would type. So with the reserved tags like body, img, and h1, you don't have to have hashtag. You don't have to have like dot. Um, when you want to select something, it's just there. Um, do you remember in our HTML, we didn't have like oh, di or body with ID or body with class. It's because it will apply these CSS rules to every single body element, every single image element within the HTML. So uh, once we get into building pages with div and IDs and classes, you would have like hashtag and then the ID or dot and then the class name. And you literally just type h1 with curly brackets, and then inside you have your uh, font, like CSS rule, and then its value. And then make sure you have a colon and a semicolon at the end. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit why the text align attribute affected the image file as well? Like okay, so, yeah, yeah. So remember the way our HTML structure is set up? Everything is within the body. So when you do text align, it, it's kind of weird, but um, you guys will end up seeing this a lot. Like text align, for some reason, it um, not only aligns the text in the middle, but it also aligns the images. It's it's really strange, but it's one of those things that I was trying to. Set, I remember when I took this class, I was trying to center an image, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. But someone just like on Stack Overflow Google, um, someone just said try text align on an image, and I said and I tried it, and it worked. So that's one of the things you'll. Realize like text align works on images and words. Yeah. So what happens is text align applies not just text but to every inline and inline block element. Um, for div and C and H1, they're block elements, so they don't get affected. But for images and anchor and stuff like that, they are inline and in block, so they get affected. 
We also learn more about inline, inline block, and block uh, when we start talking about positioning. Yeah. Okay, so um, if you see there, there's like a style. That C so we already have styles set up, so that's why it says style.css. But if you add, so this is everything we have right now, right? But if you add new rules, like, why don't you go add a Maybe like change it live, like we were doing for the body. Remember, remember how we were changing it live with the body? Yeah. Uh, you, you just type in to the um, CSS. Oh, you just type CSS. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you want to do an example? Yeah. H3. Okay, so um, we generally don't don't edit the HTML here, but you can and see like it it added an HTML tag. So basically, the inspector it it like mm, it just basically shows you exactly what's changing every time you type something. It's very responsive, I guess that's how you would call it. And if you add CSS rules, they happen right away. Does that make sense? Or I, I just, um, you were modifying the CSS uh, portion live yeah. the image. I don't know how you access that. I don't know if you did. Like, I oh, okay. So uh, if you click on, like, if we click on the image HTML tag, then you can add the rules. Yeah. Yeah. You have to copy and paste it. Cause yeah, or else everyone would just go to Facebook and change the logo to the ugly green that Sean did and save it, and Facebook would be green from now on. So yeah, you do have to save it to your um, CSS or HTML file. Yeah. Alright, yeah, so. Other changes? Yeah, so we have to. So, uh, once again, uh, Tomas and I are very sorry that this didn't work the way we planned. Uh, next time it'll be better, we promise. Um, thanks. Cool. We are going to have a little bit short, like five minutes break um, while. In case you guys missed Philip, I have this put on with uh, our special music. <laughs> <laughs>
啊啊啊啊！哈 ？Yeah, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Okay, guys, we're gonna get started with our design section. Um, TAs are passing around you the uh, the wireframe sheet for that we're gonna use for um, the hands-on. Please have it one per two people, so one per pair. So today we're gonna talk about user interface design. Um, previously, we talked about how a website is built in the um, in the design section. We talked about the HTML. HTML provides a structure. I hope all of you guys are pretty familiar with HTML by now. And um, CSS provides the design, and JavaScript provides the functionality of a web page. But today, I would like to take a step back and talk more about user interface design in general before we move into um, the specifics of the design section. So before we begin, um, I'd like to ask you guys um, a question about these two things. On the left, we have Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa. And on the right, we have um, an, an application called Airmail. And those two are, in a way, designed. One, on the left, we have like art, like artistic design. And on the right, we have user interface design. Um, those two serve as a form. But what would be the difference? What did, how do these two serve a different purpose? There would be a question for you guys. Yep, that's a good start. I just saw a hand over here. Yeah, I was going to say, you can use your input from both. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Just think of the like, response mm -hmm. between the interaction. Mm -hmm. So the responses were, um, on the left, there is no user interaction. I mean, you can't really interact with the Mona Lisa. But on the right, you can the you, user has to interact with, with the application. Um, what would be the intent behind the left? On the, on the left, what would be the intent behind Leonardo da Vinci when he was painting the Mona Lisa? Versus the intent of an application developer when they're designing airmail. Any thoughts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about on the right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, um, the response was that on the left, it's purely for aesthetics purposes, whereas on the right, it's for um, to help the user use the application, to improve user experience. And I think that's very true. Um, so I brought it up because that is really critical when you're thinking about design theory. User interface design is different from art in a way that um, it's not about making things purely pretty. I'm sure that there's a lot more to art than making things pretty, but UI user interface aesthetics is about emphasizing core features so that users, it's, it's easier for the users to use the application. And that's what we're going to be spending um, in the first half of the semester on the aesthetics of the application, how we can use aesthetics and design theory to improve user experience. And then toward the latter half of the semester, we're going to talk about the actual user experience stuff. And I talk, and throughout the semester, we're going to, I'm going to bring this up a lot, and it's emphasis. Um, the, a great user interface, we talk about people saying, oh, this website is pretty, or this website is well designed. And one of the hallmarks of well designed websites is that they emphasize the important elements and then they give priority for the important elements versus, and they de-emphasize de the elements that are not as important. And they can do it through various ways. One is through skeuomorphism, the other through flat UI, different shades of a box, different color, um, different font size, and apply animation and stuff. And that's what, we're, that's what we're gonna be discussing throughout the semester. So another question for you guys. How do you think Google emphasizes the important elements? What would be the most important element for this website right now? Yep, 
it is a search bar. And how does Google do that? In the center. And it's big. It's a big center search box. And notice that there's nothing but search box. And because there's, no, there's nothing but search box, users' eyes are gravitated toward the search box. And that's how Google emphasizes their most important feature of this service. What about this? What is the most important element in this painting? Jesus it's Jesus Christ. <laughs> and how does Leonardo da Vinci does that? In the, in the middle, through the perspective, right? The perspective is pointing to the Jesus Christ. And I would say these accomplish a similar effect. They both emphasize the important element through a similar technique, placing in the, in the, in the center. So a goal of a user interface, I guess this is the most important slide for today, is to bring order to complexity by emphasizing important elements. It's not just about making things pretty. You emphasize certain elements over another element, and that's how you improve, that's how you gravitate users' attention to certain elements, and that's how you improve user experience. Oh, by the way, today's uh, Laura Mipson word of the day is, um, I hope nobody can see this. It's, Can you guys see this? Let me try to find a better marker. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to be uh, spilling out the lower minimum of the day, random points throughout the lecture. So um, you shouldn't be just like coming in towards the end because that's not always where we're going to be when you're going to be sending out. The, nope. This is a problem. Um, Let me try to find a better marker. This is better, I think. It's this. It means certain in Latin. So yeah, this is our Lord Romanism word of the day. And um, you can fill this word out on our WDD portal. Can you guys see this? Huh? It should be all lowercase. It should be written in all lowercase. Sorry about that. All lowercase. It's case sensitive. <coughs> Goal of a user interface is to bring order to complexity by emphasizing important elements. This is very important. And um, we're going to be doing this through four things, and this kind of co this is uh, this correlates with our um, lecture curriculum. We have four things. There are four ways you can emphasize important elements. One is through spacing. Um, that includes padding, margin, give um, giving some like uh, margin between elements, padding between elements, um, typography and images, giving different font size, making it bold versus italic and stuff like that. Positioning, um, placing things on the top left tends to improve, tends to gravitate users' eyes. Color, what color should you choose? Using red, what, what kind of emotion does red appeal? And these four things are, are what we're going to be discussing throughout the semester. And today is more like an overview of these four things that we're going to be discussing throughout the semester. So in my startup, Iris, um, I try to utilize these four elements. Um, notice that I placed, for us, the most important element for our app is search. And how we, what we decided to do with the search is that we, we try to put the search bar on the top left. And generally, I'm going to mention this during our positioning lecture, placing things on the top left tends to gravitate users' attention because when you read a book, you tend to read from top left to bottom right. And that's why placing things on the top left tends to like, give emphasis. And that's why we place the search bar on the top left. And notice that on the top right, we have a notification. And the user has received 11 notifications. And you, we want to gravitate users' eyes toward the notification bar when the user has received a notification. That's why we use the red. You notice that everywhere else on the application, it's, it tends to be like white and like grayish color, like monotone. But on the, on the <coughs> notification, we use red. And that kind of like a spark of a red gravitates users' attention. And the title of the page is We Are to Bridge. It's a bridge in Venice. Um, 
And because the title of the page is very important, we decided to give it a very huge typography to, grab, to um, emphasize that element. And on, for, the, for the cards, um, notice that it's a, it looks like a card, but if you get rid of the paddings, the white space surrounding the box, um, it's going to look cluttered. So um, by giving it some white space on the cards um, that is making you see the image of the, of the Vatican, um, it's not touching the edge that makes it actually look like a card. And it gives a spacing, it gives it the emphasis towards the title of the card that is travel. So I'm going to give you some examples of redesigned websites using each of these pillars. Medium utilizes spacing very, very well. Can anyone tell me why Medium would be a good example for spacing? Maybe it could be like a like, critique session for Medium design. What's good about Medium design when it comes to spacing? I heard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So the response was that there's a lot of white space surrounding the website. And because of that, the user's eyes, where would they go? They're going to have to go to the articles, right? The articles with the big imagery and huge titles, their uh, user's eyes are gravitated toward these articles because they have nowhere else to go. What about this? There's, this is another blogging platform. It's called Subtle. Um, for them, they, I would say this is a very good example of typography and images. It could apply to spacing as well, but um, notice how their title uses a very thick, bold font with a huge font size, and they use the bold font for their logo to, uh, to highlight that as well. Um, another example would be Google Drive. Um, Google Drive, for Google Drive, it's a very good example of positioning because, again, similar to, what we, similar to our thought process behind Iris, their most important element, again, is search. So they put the search and their logo on the top left to highlight that element. And notice how if you go on Facebook, they do the same thing. Top left, logo, and search bar. And Tumblr would be a Kind of a good example for a color. Can anyone tell me why Tumblr would be a great example of a color? <coughs> color usage? Yeah. So uh, it, it has the main content in white, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of dark. So the color would show up as dark. Yeah. Yeah, that's a very good point. So the response was that the background is dark, whereas the content is light. And what that means is that there's a very good contrast between the content and the general background. And so that's a good, good point. Another point, another thing that's good about Tumblr's design is that notice that they don't use a lot of colors. Generally, they have a, a single color palette that is dark navy blue, and they use different shades of that blue, just like a darker blue versus light blue and stuff like that. And generally, it's a good idea to choose only one or two main color and, do, and go with a variation of that color instead of choosing red, white, and blue and just doing a hodgepodge mess of colors. So now we're going to move on to design cycle. Um, this is what your hands-on are going to evolve around today. And um, this is how you should approach user interface design in general. It starts off with ideation. Whenever you try to create a website or any kind of user interface, like an application, a mobile application or anything, you need to start off with identifying the need. What are you making the website for? For example, if you're making, um, if you're making a, um, an application, you have to first decide who are you making it for, what do these customers need, and what kind of a feature should, do they need. So, um, so establish the feature set for the user's need first. And then based on that, um, you need to identify the hierarchy. So you're going to have a list of features that the user is going to want, or you are going to want. And based on that, order them by priority. What is the most important element versus what is not so important element? And then based on your hierarchy, you have to think about what kind of design should you, should you choose. So actual design stuff, actual design thinking, the, the aesthetics of the interface comes last in this ideation process. It starts off with the need first, and then the features, and actual artsy design stuff is towards the last. 
So you shouldn't start an application, start a website by saying that maybe I should choose red first. You shouldn't do that. First think about the need first, and then think about the design. Um, I think, because we're running out of time. So let's start with Craigslist. What would be the purpose of Craigslist? Thoughts? <laughs> Uh huh. So the response was, it's a uh, it's a marketplace for people. They want to post products that they want to sell, and that's what they're doing. And so that would be the need. The need is the marketplace for users. So based on that need, what are what would be the most important feature for a Craigslist? Yeah. Search. Search. Yeah. Yeah, so the response was search, and I kind of agree because if you think about it, if I want to buy a product, I'm going to have to first search first. So, yeah. Categories? What do you mean, categories? Like, if you're trying to sell numbers, you should find those and then mm -hmm. buy. Yeah, so the response is uh, was that um, it's categories. It kind of ties in with the search. It's basically along the lines of discovery. So, how can you help users discover their product through search, through category? And this is what they built. So I guess we had this need to like marketplace, and we had this feature. The feature was search and category. Does Craigslist really emphasize search? Where is search bar right now? It is. The search bar is very, very small on the left sidebar. And it's very, it's, and even calendar is bigger than the search bar. So it's not that, it's not that emphasized. Do any of you use calendar on Craigslist? No. Yeah, that's a, yeah. So this is a very big issue for Craigslist when it comes to emphasis. <laughs> so this would be a Craigslist misuse of emphasis. We actually use Craigslist as our redesign candidate for our group project uh, fall 2013. So what they what the students did was they took Craigslist and they redesigned it, um, and some of them were pretty darn good. So yeah. So. You have this need, you have these features, so now you have to think about the design. So before you approach any kind of design, you have to first get some inspiration first. Look at other websites and how they do it and try to like take what's good about them. So what would be other great e-commerce websites, shopping mall websites? Amazon. Amazon. Any other good ones? eBay. eBay is a good one. They, eBay was pretty terrible, but they recently redesigned their website and now it's pretty good. So we have Amazon. Um, what would be, what are, what are, what's Amazon trying to emphasize in this website right now? <laughs> yeah, so it's a shopping mall, but yeah, they're really trying hard to sell their phones. But, um, but again, notice the search bar. It's huge on the top center. It's immediately accessible. And the category is on the top left. Again, top left, they have a sidebar. So generally, it is, very, it, it is far more accessible um, for the users when it comes to what they're looking for compared to Craigslist. And when it comes to shopping mall websites, images are very important. So you have to think about what websites use images well. What would be some websites that use images very pr um, prominently? Etsy. What, what was it? Etsy. Etsy? I actually don't know that, that website, but check it out. Yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. Oh, cool, cool. Yeah, yeah, clothing companies at, like Abercrombie, like those websites, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what you're trying to say? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I saw a hand here. Uh, YouTube. YouTube would be good, yeah, with the thumbnails of the videos, yeah. So uh, YouTube is good, um, clothing website is also good. The example that I chose was Pinterest. Uh, Pinterest has thumbnails all over, and they use a, their iconic masonry UI. Um, so Pinterest and masonry UI is not a good example of a website that uses images. So what a lot of people did for a fall 2013 uh, redesign of Craigslist was they tried to copy the Pinterest UI a little bit, try to use the Pinterest-style gallery UI on the Craigslist, and it worked out pretty well. So yeah. And when it comes to um, getting inspirations, I suggest checking out Dribbble. Dribbble is a website that has um, where designers post um, their UI designs. 
So if you are looking for a, I can show an example. Let's say I want to look for a gallery website, like pictures. I can type in gallery on the search bar. It's going to show you all, like what other designers have um, designed about gallery. Or if I want to look for designs about blogs, it shows you designers' works about blogs. So you can look at these and kind of get inspirations about how they're doing it. Because when you're first starting to, when you're first approaching this industry of UI design, you don't quite have an idea of what is a good design. So one of the best ways to do it is to look at how other people do it and learn from others. And now that you've done all the ideation, the planning step, now it's time to prototype. And by prototyping, I, I don't mean by just diving into code right away. You should start with a sketch because um, it's going to save you a ton of time. I mean, let's face it, like sketching up a website is it's going to take you like an hour. But compared to like actually coding a website, that's going to take you like a day, a week. So um, there are many types of prototypes. One is lo-fi prototype. Lo-fi prototype is something that doesn't take a lot of time. It's very rough sketches. And um, second type is hi-fi prototype. This includes HTML5, CSS, or Photoshop markup. All the prototypes with a lot of detail, those would be hi-fi prototype. To give you an example, um, when I was make, working on an iris, I started off with a sketch. Um, we, had a, we had a double, like we had a side-by-side -side UI, where on the left, we had a list. On the right, we had the article, and I drew out the sketch real quick. And then based on the sketch, I can translate to this to an actual website like this. And um, it's really important because when you're designing, um, you, it's important to get feedback. If I had to start by um, designing this, then it's going to take me a week to make this. So to get feedback, I have to wait a week to get a feedback. But if I were to sketch the website, it's only going to take me like an hour to get the feedback. And um, what our sponsoring professor, Bjorn Hartman, recommended was try using Keynote or PowerPoint, the presentation software to prototype a UI. I never thought it would be really good, but I tried it out. It's really, really effective. So I would like to give you a demo on how to use the presentation software to really quickly prototype your UI. What we're going to be doing is we're going to make something like this. Um, it's my new portfolio website. It's a work in progress. Um, and this is what we're going to be trying to make in our demo. Oh, shit. So right now I'll be using Keynote, but if you have a PowerPoint, um, you can, it works pretty similar in similar ways, except I think Keynote has, just has a better user experience. So I just create a new slide. And notice that what I need is I need four squares, four boxes, and another box in the center. So I do that real quick. I'm going to draw four boxes right here. Copy. And I'm going to copy again. And draw another square. Yeah, you see this? It'll be how long would it take if you were to like code this stuff? Oh shit! I'm gonna. If only coding was this easy. So now I need some text. So I'm gonna add some uh, text. And it's gonna say, "I am John Park." over here as well. And this one's going to be right aligned. Oh. Over here. And for the sake of time, I'm just going to leave that here. And it's going to look something like this. Again, it's really simple. You just have to like drag and drop user interface. It's like add a text, add a circle, and um, yeah, you have a lo-fi prototype. And once you're done with this, you can go and show other people like your design, what do you think, um, give critique, and stuff like that. So now we're going to change this to a hi-fi prototype. Right now we have a lo-fi, 
to make this a hi-fi prototype, you're going to have to add in some colors and typography. So I'm just going to do one, one box right here. Um, to go from here to here, I'm going to have to get rid of the border. So style, line, no border, no shadow, um, pretty much flat UI. I'm um, going to make this the ugly green. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> the font is Proxima Nova. Pretty sure you, don't, you won't like this font either. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> Gonna make this white. Gonna make this bold. It's getting there. Now I'm gonna make, I'm gonna de-emphasize I am because Sean Park is more important than I am. <laughs> um, I'm going to go to color, I'm going to make the opacity 60%. I'm going to cover this in color lecture. You can fit out the opacity to de-emphasize certain elements. So now we have this box. And once I finish applying um, these styles to other elements, it's going to look something like this. And it looks sim pretty much in line with the actual coded website like this. So again, it takes really small, like really few, like really little time to um, prototype a UI using presentation software like Keynote or PowerPoint. So I highly suggest you try that out in your spare time. So what should you prototype first? Um, we have four things. We have spacing, typography, images. We have color, positioning. What should you focus first when you're prototyping a, a design? Um, I suggest you um, go outside in, go with the general big stuff first, and then focus down on the smaller elements. Because smaller elements, um, if, even if you change it, it's not going to affect other elements. Whereas general layout of a website, if you change it, it's going to change the entire website. So that would be you start with the positioning, create the layout of the website first, and then worry about the spacing, so evenly spaced out the elements, and then move on to other elements like the color and typography. Because typography is the smallest element on your website, you worry about that the last. So this is how you approach put prototyping. And then I kind of mentioned the importance of evaluation. Um, it is extremely important that you ask feedback among your peers. Um, I suggest you typically ask at least 10 people before you settle down on a design. And design is prone to changing uh, very quickly. So for example, for my startup Iris, at March, it looked like this. And when we asked for users' feedbacks, um, they figured that the sidebar is not that accessible. So um, what happens is, by default, the sidebar on the left, it's not visible. If you click on the eye icon on the, on the top left, the sidebar pulls up from the left. But that means that by default, the sidebar is hidden. And that means that for the users, they were having trouble finding and accessing the items in the sidebar. So what we did was, we took the sidebar out. We took um, all the items on the sidebar out so that it is easier for the users to access these elements. And um, another feedback that we got now that we are on this UI is that there isn't enough content space for the articles. I mean, you have the sidebar taking up the 240 pixels on the left, and users prefer that they would like to see the article, just the article, without anything else. So we iterated again, and this is what we have now. Now that everything is in the top bar, and the content takes place um, from left edge to the right edge. So um, we never know. Like when, we, when I first designed this version, I thought this was perfect. But I never know, and you never know until you actually ask the user and get feedback from the user. So yeah, now we're going to get on to the hands-on section. Um, it's going to be revolved around design cycle. Do you have a question here? Yeah, so uh, you said you go and get like, feedback. Yeah. Yeah, so I guess um, there are many ways you can do it. Um, the approach that I would use is I don't give them any clues on what this app is. And I have them fitter, like, I have them like we sit on, like, on, a, on a Starbucks and we have them use the application for 10 minutes. That's one way. Um, that's like non guided uh, feedback. Um, another way you could do is you can ask them, you can give them instructions. So, for example, from here, you can ask, so how would you find an article that you'd be interested in? You give them instructions, and based on that, it'd be like a question and answer platform. Okay. Actually, I 
Ich hier, also ich habe noch ein Video. All right, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Can you guys hear me? No. <laughs> All right, anyways, we need to move on. So hi, my name's Hamza, and I'm one of the TAs on the design section, in case you guys forgot. I'm Ingrid. Okay, so <laughs> for the sake of time, we're going to rush through this one a little bit. Uh, so what we have here is a website called IMDB. And what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be applying the design cycle that Sean talked about to this website, okay? So does anyone remember what step one of the design cycle is? <coughs> yes. So the answer was you figure out, figure out what you need it for, right? So step one of the design cycle is called ideation, okay? And what ideation is, is, is basically addressing these three important questions about a website, okay? So if we want to analyze this website and critique it, we're going to need to answer this first question, which is, what is the purpose of this website? So can I go and tell me what the purpose of the website is? Yes? Selling Amazon Prime. <laughs> selling Amazon Prime. <laughs> so the answer was selling Amazon Prime. <laughs> Does anyone have any other suggestions? Database yes. For he said it's a d database for moving information. Movie. Movie information. OK, yes, that sounds very pretty accurate. Um, so yeah, you guys can talk about this in your groups. So that's what we're going to have you do here, is we're going to have you, you get into your groups of two people and uh, answer those questions. All right, and the second question of the design cycle is, uh, the first step is uh, to order the features on the website from greatest important to least important. So can anyone tell me what the most important feature of this website is? <laughs> she said the search feature. Does anyone have any other suggestions? I, di I didn't say that's wrong. I'm just asking for all the suggestions. Yeah. The featured HD trailers. The featured HD trailers. All right. Does anyone have any other suggestions? Jennifer Lawrence. Jennifer Lawrence. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So as you can tell, this website has a bunch of features. Like it, it has too many features that it's it's actually getting really disturbing and really cluttered here. <laughs> so that's a problem we need to address. So th that's actually the third question of the designs of the step one, which is to to see which uh, which feature you can actually improve upon. All right, so I'm going to hand it over to Ingrid to talk about the second step of the design cycle. Okay, so he kind of went over it, but we're going to talk about what features can be improved upon. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. So um, we kind of listed some features. Um, so not including Jennifer Lawrence, what are some features that can be improved upon and uh, you think <laughs> can be changed <laughs> other than Jennifer Lawrence and Amazon Prime? <laughs> yeah, okay, we don't change her. So yeah, so what features <laughs> would do you think we should change if we could like create IMDb? Yes. Maybe like the background for the photo section. The background like over here? For the version of Okay. Um anyone else? Yeah. Separating the two trailers, maybe like by message. Separating these three trailers? Okay. Anyone else? So think about what is uh, what is the purpose of the website and how the current look is not helping with the current, like your most important feature. Did you have? Make the search bar bigger because you think the. Make the black, orange. Black. Oh, this part. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so we're almost out of time. So um, we're going to let you guys work on this right now. So think about what features you want to improve upon and what this website is about. And we gave you all pieces of paper that looks like kind of a browser window. And right now, you and your partner should sketch out kind of what you imagine this page should look like. Yeah. yeah. I think we have pretty good enough time. Give them a slide of time.